I'm Ed Denson. I'm a longtime cannabis lawyer here. I became a lawyer in 1999. I defended about 200 people against uh, various cultivation charges. Some of them got off. I was pretty happy with that. And um, this year they sort of stopped busting people and I'm doing licensing. So I'm going to talk to you about the feds, what you can grow with no permit, commercial cannabis, what are you going to do when the sheriff shows up, guns, a little bit of extraction, how you can get into big trouble if you like drama, and your felonies could vanish. Now, is everybody in this room a grower? Yes. Yep. Is anybody doing extraction? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Back there? All right. So, first question is, why aren't the feds out here busting everybody? There are two answers to that question. One of them is the Cole Memo, which the Attorney General, back when we had Democrats, uh, sent out to all the U.S. attorneys. And he said, don't mess with people who are state legal doing cannabis. That memo could be eradicated with the stroke of a pen. I don't know if you've seen Trump's big signatures and everything, but he could do that just one afternoon when there was nothing else to do because that memo is not law and it wasn't approved by Congress or any such thing. The other thing that's protecting me is the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment to the budget. And what it said was, it's, there is no money in the federal budget for prosecuting state legal marijuana operations. The feds were prosecuting anyway in California, like Harborside and some of the bigger dispensaries. And they went to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit said, no money means no money. You cannot further these prosecutions, and they dropped them all. That amendment apparently survived April 28th when they had to extend the budget. My understanding is that amendment is still in the law, in the budget, and that means it will be until September, unless you know, they do a special act of Congress to get rid of it, which I doubt that they will. So, I'm going to hit the recreational stuff lightly because I don't imagine it's a great concern here. Uh, if you're 21 years old, you can grow six plants at your residence or in your yard behind some sort of locked gate. You've got to keep it all when you trim it. You cannot sell it. You can't give it away. Nothing. That's your marijuana. You can give away one ounce and at a time, and you can carry one ounce at a time. So I suppose if you wanted to give somebody a pound, you could make a lot of trips. But basically speaking, this stuff is totally off the market. Everybody can grow it, but they can't sell it, they can't distribute it, they can't give it away for any effective purposes. So, people with 215s who are not giving it away can grow. In this county, they can grow 100 square feet, no questions asked. They got a 215, 100 square feet of canopy. Mendocino uh, chickened out, they have a different standard. But in every county, there is some pres presumed need. You can grow all you need. But the counties have set a level where they say, if you don't have any more than this, we're just going to presume you need it. And in Humboldt, that's 100 square feet. That figure is important to commercial growers because basically speaking, as we will come to later, you need a script for every 100 square feet. 
if you want to sail through police inspections. Okay. The big question really is, uh, let's say I have a 215, can I grow six recreational plants and 100 square feet of medical? And the answer seems to be yes, but I got to keep it all. I cannot, if I give that marijuana to somebody else, then I'm becoming commercial if I get anything for it. Commercial means an exchange for value. It doesn't mean money, or it isn't restricted to money. So if you mow my lawn and I give you an ounce, which is pretty good pay for a lawn, I guess, uh, that's a commercial exchange. I need a permit to grow the marijuana that I did that with or to distribute it. So, big deal. Cultivation for recreational use for other people is illegal. It's against the law. And that's, that's all there is to it. Okay. This year, all marijuana that's going to be distributed to other people than the person that grows it has to be medical. That means you have to have a 215. Everybody that gets the marijuana has to have a 215. Everybody who helps you grow it, everybody who touches it, everybody who has any possession of this marijuana or comes into contact with it has to be a medical patient who is a member of your collective. They can become a member orally, handshake, anything like that. There's no formalities required. But for your own protection, anybody that's going to be using that marijuana, that you're not selling like through a dispensary or to some other set up collective, you should get them to sign a membership form for you, for your collective, that says that they are associating with you to cultivate the marijuana. So, there's, this is really the big problem that most growers are going to have this year. It's getting those 215s, getting those collectives, keeping that stuff straight. I'm working with about 80 people on licensing, and the issue that comes up are the 215. So now we're going to do a, a thought experiment, okay? You're at home, in, there's all your marijuana. You're in your car, you've got 25 pounds with you going to a dispensary. You're running a dispensary. The sheriff walks in, and what happens? If you're cultivating, if you're here in Humboldt, you show him the affidavit that you got when you turned in your minimum permit application. You remember that affidavit? Okay. You've signed it. It's embossed. Whatever you do, for God's sake, don't laminate it. Because then the embossing is lost. And it's the embossing that makes it the original, genuine thing. Just make a copy and laminate the copy. Okay. That shows that although you don't have your permit yet, you are in the process of getting your permit. And that's enough this year. Because, of course, they've got 2,500 applications and they've kicked out about 150 or something permits. Most people haven't even turned in the full application. And by the way, there's a six month period to do that. So if you got in there on the last day of December, the last day of June is your last day. You've either got to get, get it in or you've got to get an extension from them. Otherwise, they cancel the permit, keep the money, and you have to apply again. But you can't apply again. They're not taking applications. So just make sure that you either get it complete before the six months from the date you turned it in in the first place, or you get an extension from them. You let them know 
you're working on it, you just got to get one more permit, and you go ahead, and they'll give you the extension. Okay, so you show the sheriff your affidavit. He says, okay, that's great, you're getting a permit. That's really wonderful. And God, look at all the cannabis you've got. That's great cannabis. You've got so much of it. Who's getting it? If you answer that question wrong, the sheriff is going home with all your cannabis. You are going to get a letter inviting you to show up in court. So I'll tell you what the wrong answer is right away. I've got a friend who has a contact with a dispensary down in the city, and he's looking into it for me. That's not cutting it. You are supposed to have these connections set up before you go in the ground. But that's the idea of a collective. You are growing for known people so that they can get the marijuana they want. There's a certain amount of fiction in this, as you might guess, but you've got to have either the 215s or a letter from a dispensary saying you're a grower member and they want you to provide for 100 patients, whatever, whatever number of patients uh, could use the amount you're growing. So that everything that you're growing, the po your potential harvest, is accounted for. So that affidavit, by the way, if you read it, says that you are operating in accordance with state medical marijuana law, which is precisely what we've been talking about. So the sheriff asks you that, you are shaking. You show him your 215s, you are shaking hands with the sheriff, all right? He says, that's great. You're doing a great job. Sorry to have bothered you. Have a nice day. And he drives off. And they've apparently actually done this. I mean, it's not just a fantasy. They have checked out a few people because they got complaints from the neighbors. Too much pot. It smells bad. There's too much traffic. I know they're a bunch of drug dealers, whatever. They, that's how they figure out where to go. They don't do what you might think is logical. Look at the county GIS and see this immense grow and then check the permit list and see that there's no application and go there. No, that's too easy. They just, when they get a complaint, they go out there. Now they've got the resources, they tell me, to do about 100 inspections. There are about 10,000 uh, 10, growers, it's estimated. So the odds favor, no matter how you're growing, no matter what you're doing, the odds favor that you're not going to get busted. One result of that is an enormous number of superstitions and bad advice because people have some strange idea, you know, the, the flag had a fringe on it, so I, I don't have to go to court. But they can have that idea. If they never get arrested, it doesn't make any difference. So the, the problem is, if you go along with it, and then you get arrested, you get into court, and the judge says, that's nonsense. And you can say, well, I'll take it to the Supreme Court, and good luck with that you know, 10 years and a million dollars later. So you need to <coughs> just do this compliance at the onset. If you're driving with a lot of pot in the car, you're, you're delivering to a dispensary or something like that, you're taking it somewhere to, to get it trimmed, whatever. You're, gonna, you're taking it to the lab to test. Here's some advice. Let's say it's the dispensary. You, first of all, you've got a letter from the dispensary saying you are a grower member. They want the pot. Secondly, if at all possible, you get a purchase order. This is a business now, right? So you get a purchase order from them, if you can. At the least, 
They know you're coming. They know what you're bringing them. They're expecting it. They want it. And if the cop calls them from the side of the road and says, I got Ed Denson here. He's got 25 pounds. He says he's a member and he's bringing it to you. What about it? And they say, oh, God, yeah, we've been waiting for him all morning. We really need that stuff. Uh, can you get in front of him with the siren and get him through traffic? Okay. That'll be good. Because if the cop can confirm it's legit, you're going to travel on down the road. But if there are a bunch of questions, if there's stuff he's got to check out later, and things like that, he's not going to take the chance on letting you go. He's going to grab you and take the chance that it'll all clear up. Okay. Suppose you're driving back with the $50,000 in your car and you get stopped. You need to explain why you've got $50,000 in cash. And the explanation is, I just made a delivery to a dispensary. This is the payment for it. Here's the receipt they gave me for the marijuana medicine. And here's, the, that's why they gave me the money. Call them up if you don't believe it. Okay? That's your safest bet for getting that money home safely. If, by the way, if they grab it, you can still get it back. But it just means you've got to hire me or somebody like me to do it, and I get some of the money. So, now, here's something I didn't used to have to tell everybody, but there have been so few arrests these years that this knowledge has sort of slipped away. If the cops arrest you, if the cops seize your stuff, you say, I'm invoking my right to remain silent. I'm not going to answer any questions until my lawyer is with me. That's step one. Step two, and this is crucial, shut up. Okay, because if you keep talking, if they say, well, you know, we can't use this against you because you invoked your rights, that's bullshit. They can use it against you, and they will. You just, you told them you're going to be quiet, be quiet. If when the cops come, people get nervous, as we've just seen. And when they get nervous, what they want to do is convince the cop, really, I'm not a criminal. I'm a nice guy. Uh, you guys don't have to, you know, really come down hard on me. I'm such a nice guy. The gun's over there in the trailer. I'm such a nice guy. I've got more pot in the basement. You probably didn't see that. Let me show you where it is. It starts off with kind of happy talk. Hey, how about those Niners, huh? Pretty good, the cop says. You start talking about the Niners, and the next thing you know, you're old friends now. Uh-uh. Okay. Speaking of guns, the Second Amendment gives you the right to keep and bear arms. Okay? If you're a felon, you don't have that right. More about felons later. There are things that we can do. But, if you've got guns on the same property, you've got cannabis. Here's some advice, okay? Number one, don't be walking around with a loaded gun when the cops come, okay? You think that's strange, but I just defended a guy who was in exactly that situation. And when he, he thought it, actually he thought it was the neighbors coming to jump him. But as soon as he saw it was the cops, he threw it in the bushes. But they saw him do it. At least they knew he wasn't going to try and shoot them. But nevertheless, it did make for some awkward moments in court. So my recommendation is that the guns are never loaded. They're in the gun safe, locked. The ammo is in the gun safe, locked. That way, that's your best bet against not getting a firearm enhancement charge against you, as well as the cannabis charge. Also, if they take those guns, you can get them back, but it's an unbelievable drag. It 
it just takes forever. There's the procedural crap from one end to the other. So, you've got an absolute right to have those guns. You've got a right to be carrying the gun. But my advice is that you don't push those rights just yet because you're more interested in having the right to grow the pot. I'm going to hit this very briefly then with the extraction. Health and Safety Code 11379.6 parenthesis A says that you cannot extract using chemical synthesis or, uh, let's see, you can't manufacture, compound, convert, produce, derive, process, prepare, either directly or indirectly by chemical extraction or independently by means of chemical synthesis. I don't think this means the rosin fronts, but it does mean just about everything else. CO2 definitely out, unless, I mean there's an unless here, but if this is, is basically a meth lab law, and the pot just got in there by accident, but it's in there. And they regard the processing extraction this way as a major felony. A normal felony is what we call a 1623. You could get 16 months if you just did it a little bit, get two years if you did it medium, just the normal, or three years if you were real bad. Okay. This is a 357. So the typical sentence is five years in the state prison. And a fine, not exceeding $50,000. So the county has got a list of, uh, they will give you an extraction permit. And they've got a list of things that need to be met before they give you that permit. And you should be meeting those things, or you should not be extracting. Because, you know, the odds of getting arrested are not high, but the consequences are. So, you have to weigh that. Now, cultivation is a misdemeanor these days. You can have a million plants, it's still a misdemeanor. But, there is a way to make it a felony. And that way is to be illegally cultivating and doing environmental damage. If that happens, this is not a misdemeanor case, it's a felony court case. Now, Chris was just talking about registering with Adona White and the North Coast Water Quality Board. Everybody should be doing it, whether they get a permit or not, because that's the best way of ensuring that you are not in violation of the environmental laws. Adona, is, she has come out and visited any number of my clients and nobody has ever complained. She's either helped them fill out the paperwork to register with the water board. So I recommend that. Now I want to talk to you about a recent felony case. This, this part of the lecture is called What Could Go Wrong? This is a case currently in Humboldt County Court. They found 2,000 unpermitted plants on this parcel. The guy had also leased the neighboring parcel to somebody who had 7,000 more plants. He had eight firearms. Then Fish and Wildlife found out that he had been filling stream channels, he had built an artificial dam, he had evacuated a spring and was diverting water to a pond. No permits. Then they found a leaking diesel tank, trash and plant fertilizers in, an, in a way, placed in a way so that they could pollute the Van Dusen River. And it turned out he'd used heavy equipment to, to fall trees, cut roads, form landings. So he's charged with a felony. He's looking at 
four and a half years in prison for this. Now, this is somewhat of an extreme case. Now, the last thing about that case is, on top of the criminal penalties, he faces civil penalties of $8,000 a day and up. In other words, they're going to confiscate the land. That's what that comes to. Here's some other good ideas to not do. Don't employ a minor. Don't give marijuana to someone under 18. Don't try to. And don't import, export, or try to import and export from the state over an ounce of bud or four grams of hash. Okay. Now, let's say that you've got everything right. You've got your affidavit, you've got your patience, everything's going swell, and the dispensary goes under. The collective collapses. All of a sudden, there you are with all of this cannabis and no patience. As the camo cowboy said, what are you going to do with all this weed? Okay, you, so far, you're still legal, but you've got to take action quick. You've got to find another collective or dispensary, and fast. You find them, you join them, everything's going to be cool. Now, let's talk about one big union. The question here is, can you be in more than one co-op, one, more than one collective? Can you sell to more than one dispenser? And the answer appears to be <coughs> yes. But not all of the DAs and sheriffs are quite up on this law. But my, my legal opinion of reading the law is that you can be in any number of collectives. Just like when these people go to trim scene, they sign up in a collective at every booth to get that free dab or something. That's not illegal. They can be in all those collectives. The, the real question is, can all those collectives count on that 215 as though they were the only one to have it? And the answer there is almost certainly no, but there's just no way to check, really, to see if who's in what collective. There's no great uh, registry. All right, let's talk about felonies. Some people have some felonies left over from the bad old days, right? Okay, if those felonies are from out of state or from the feds, I don't know what to do about them. But if your felonies are from California, I do know what to do about them. If they are for the standard marijuana cultivation, possession for sale, transportation, sales, those can be reduced to misdemeanors in a fairly simple court procedure. And the courts really don't have any choice about it. The law says those can be reduced. Now, it would be nice to reduce those because, for one thing, then you won't be a felon, at least for that reason. It'll simplify getting your license, your state license. Right? Um, it doesn't matter how old those felonies are. I've got some people with stuff going back into the 80s, and we're still cleaning out all of that up. Now, felonies involving nonviolent possession of other drugs can be reduced, but it's not as simple and it's not as effective, but those can be reduced to misdemeanors through Prop 47. The last resort, if you got, I have a guy with a felony DUI. The only thing we can do about a felony like that is try to get him a certificate of rehabilitation. If he has been out of court for five or seven years, we can apply for it and get a certificate of rehabilitation. And the state regulations, which are just coming out now, recognize those things. So um, any felony <coughs> in this state can probably be ameliorated or knocked out to a misdemeanor, and in some cases, uh, if you got a felony in the old days for six pot plants, we can get that reduced to nothing. 
that can be taken totally off your record. So, uh, if you need to clean your record up for the uh, state permit application process, see a lawyer like me. But there are plenty of other lawyers who do this work too.